especially grateful today to be speaking with Dr. Craig Detweiler. Dr. Detweiler is the former president of the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology, co-founder of the Windrider Institute, and currently president of the Wedgwood Circle. Dr. Detweiler is also author of many books on media and culture, including the 2013 book, I Gods, How Technology Shapes Our Spiritual and Social Lives. Dr. Detweiler, we're so grateful to be speaking with you today. Absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for having me on. Dr. Detweiler, if I may ask, first of all, uh, this book came out in 2013, if, and if I am correct, this was your first book uh, on technology specifically. You had written many books on media, but this was the first on tech. Can you share with me, what was the impetus for writing this book? I wrote I Gods first and foremost as a parent, as someone who uh, was dealing with the pressure that my kids faced, where it's like, I need a phone, I need a phone to be part of the social group and to be uh, kind of involved in the 21st century. And I didn't really find a lot of how-to guides. And I really hadn't found a theological base that helped me understand how should I approach uh, technology? How have Christians approached technology across the centuries? Um, and so I started just doing research for myself to try to think a little more uh, deeply and uh, purposefully around the subject. And at the end of all that research, I decided, you know what, I've got enough here <laughs> For, uh, for a book that is the kind of thing that I was looking for, and maybe it'll be helpful to other people. If I may ask, there are a lot of potential connotations surrounding this word, I-gods. You use the term very provocatively in your text. What exactly do you mean by this expression, I-gods? Well, at, at the time, uh, the iMac was, a, was a, a growing interest for people, and you have, of course, the iPod and the iPhone. And so I thought, well, let's play with that a little bit. And, and I, what I'm referring to when I refer to iGods is the, a bit of the totalizing or monopolizing approach that has, has resulted from this technological revolution where there really are maybe just a handful of companies that dominate a huge portion of our daily lives in, in how we interact and, and how we're paying attention to each other. So the iGods, uh, yeah, are immediately, right? It's people who are giving us the phones and creating things uh, like Apple. It's the people who dominate our commerce, like Amazon. It's uh, the folks we turn to when we uh, want to resolve arguments with friends, when we're saying, did that really happen and when? We almost always go to Google. And uh, when we're interacting with friends, we're often doing that through Facebook or at least they're related companies like Instagram. So I want to look at those four companies, which are, in a sense, the, the I-gods, the, the billion-dollar ideas that have uh, fueled this, this boom. Uh, and, and then I also wanted to challenge a little bit as to their uh, desire to kind of create a certain loyalty, you know, where uh, they became the only portal or the only way to do commerce or to find information or to connect with friends. And, uh, and I find that a little bit dangerous, you know, not just uh, commercially, but also spiritually. Uh, do I want to give this much power away to uh, only just a handful of companies? And then also the iGods uh, are also the founders of those companies who have risen in the pantheon in terms of, you know, books about, uh, management and business and entrepreneurship where Steve Jobs is held up to a certain kind of uh, untouchable status in, in the technological pantheon or then this next generation, right? Uh, somebody like Mark Zuckerberg or, or Jeff Bezos coming along. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with that question of um, have we ascribed too much power to too few people who are making too large a claim on our lives? Dr. Detweiler, in this book, you do do an in-depth study uh, of tech companies and also the powerful leaders who built these companies and are at the core of these companies. You've, you've mentioned them, Steve Jobs at Apple, Jeff Bezos at Amazon, Brandon Page at Google, uh, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. What is it that you learned as you searched out the success of these creators of these tech giants? Well, I wanted to, um, in a sense, give them credit for creating billion dollar ideas. Uh, we've never really seen things take off with such mass acceptance at the same time. So I wanted to figure out, well, what problem were they solving for? 
what was the genius in the sense behind their idea. And as I thought about it, I, I thought um, the i the i pod and then the iPhone took off when we had that problem of kind of too much music. And he said, oh, I, I, you can have it here in your hand, in your pocket. You can carry all those CDs or cassettes or, or the various LP formats you've had over your life. Now it's all available in your hand. Um, when it came to Google, I was like, what did Google solve for? Well, they really solved for the problem of too much information. Um, what did Amazon do? How do we sort through all the books? How do I, you know, there's so many books I want that the bookstore can't carry. Amazon said, bring your problem of too many books to us. And then what did Facebook do? Well, Facebook solved the, the question of almost too many friendships or too many relationships. Uh, it's like I couldn't keep track of people's email addresses. It would change from format to format. Well, here was a place that said, no, we're going to all just be here. And so it doesn't matter what job they're in or whether they change from this school address to that, uh, you know, commercial address. Everybody's going to be on Facebook. And I realized that all four of those companies then were actually pro solving for a problem of too much, too much music, too much information, too many books, uh, too many friends. And, uh, and that's interesting, right? Because so much of our fundamentals of economics are often rooted in the question of scarcity. And these four people all solve for questions of abundance. That's a very different theological question um, that I'm not sure we're used to thinking about. Um, but when you think about Jesus uh, and the miracles, right, he often, they ended up with, with buckets and baskets left over, right, once he blessed the bread. So there is a theology of abundance that's possible that we haven't really approached in the scripture. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was look at the, I'd say the founding stories um, in the same way that, you know, our understanding in Genesis of who we are as people uh, and who God is as creator, well, that informs right, that how we live our life, our, our theological anthropology. So I wanted to do the same thing with these companies, figure out, well, what problem were they solving for? What are, how do they view human condition? How do they view technology? How um, ambitious might they be? Are they overly enthusiastic? Um, all those kinds of things. Um, and so I, I guess I questioned the I-gods uh, and interrogated them a bit at the same time critique them, appreciated the, the genius, the economic genius, the creative genius, but also wanted to, um, I guess, challenge the, the fealty that they may demand from us as, as perhaps false idols. Actually, it's interesting. My wife pointed out to me uh, as I finished uh, the book, she said, you know, it's interesting. Um, all four uh, white males, of course, uh, which creates a certain kind of dynamic in the tech industry that is... Um, overwhelming at times but she also noted that they uh also maybe struggle a little bit with interpersonal relationships that, that may not be their strong suit in how they deal with other people or even if they want to deal with other people in a face-to-face -face kind of way and so it's interesting that in the sense the i gods have created these devices that have uh created the world that is more comfortable for them uh that where they may prefer that uh, certain kind of distance from each other uh, and we have now all conformed in a sense our behavior to their coding wow that's an amazing observation <laughs> you write in the introduction of your book quote this book is about how technologies entertain and enthrall us we are tethered to our mobile devices they comfort us when we're lonely reassure us when we're lost, organize us when we're feeling out of control. They are an electronic security blanket, a way for families and friends to feel close despite the distance that may separate us. They offer us an easy way to pass the time between things when we are waiting for something to start or someone to show up. We can sink into our cell phones when we are bored, when we are scared, or when we are eager to share some great news. However, Delight can de devolve into devotion. It is good to be connected to family and friends, but when we cannot resist the urge to check updates or upload a photo, we are veering toward idolatry. How, unquote, how is it that we can ensure that our technology does not usurp the place of God in our lives? Mm, great question, Jonathan. Um, I, think, I think I saw... Uh, as a, as a professor teaching, I saw so many students who, in a sense, wanted to be present in the classroom, and yet because they were taking notes on their, on their computer, they had access to all these different screens, all these different prompts, and they felt a certain urgency 
where uh, you know mom and dad maybe expected them to respond immediately. Uh, and if they didn't, they, they'd fear the worst. Like, oh, my, my son or daughter must be dead because they haven't texted me back. And it's like, no, they actually might be in class <laughs> and trying to focus on something else. So the book, I Gods itself, was a form of pushing pause uh, in my own life, uh, in my family's life, and challenging others to do the same. Um, it's interesting that, you know, the, the, the call to Sabbath, the call to rest, is so foundational to who we are as people, as, um, as creatures, uh, that, that uh, the always-on, always-present uh, electronic leash uh, I think has robbed us a bit of that Sabbath space. And so I, I find that students feel more stressed out. I find that in our family, right, there's always distractions and oh, I need to respond and this and that. So we started to figure out how to create an electronic uh, Sabbath where you're actually putting things down, turning things off in a very conscious way and saying, I need room, I need distance to kind of reclaim who I am as a person, to reprioritize my life and, and, and try to say, okay, well, where am I taking my prompt? Is that notification of what matters today? Is it coming from the phone first thing in the morning when I wake up or is it coming from pausing long enough to take some divine direction and inspiration, um, both to order my day and to bring me the peace of mind uh, that passes all understanding. I so appreciate the reflection. And Dr. Detweiler, can we focus in on that uh, topic of note taking just for a minute? So what do we do? So many of us have so much of our lives organized by the computer that if we show up to a class or if we're uh, working people, we show up to meetings without our computer, we're just gonna have to file all that information in our computer later if we don't put it in right at the meeting. But the other problem is exactly as you say, because that computer is tied to the rest of the world, we don't necessarily want to invite the whole world into that meeting. How, what, what do you do for taking notes to maximize concentration and productivity? Um, well, I am definitely, you know, I mean, you'll find me on social media. You'll find me, you know, uh, on all kinds of uh, formats throughout a given day. But it's that ability to turn it off at times for seasons, to, to go on a walk and to, and to put your phone down. You say, I don't need to be reached now. In fact, I need to be not reachable. I need to uh, have space for uh for ideas and and sparks and divine intervention to enter into my space so many of jesus's transformative moments occurred on the road um right where he's walking with his disciples between spaces and we've now filled up so many of those in between spaces with these digital distractions and um and so now it's sort of like the only time we're not surrounded by that electronic tether might be like in the shower or when we're swimming. And so it's like we need to create, in a sense, um, kind of cell-free uh, zones or bubbles in our life that allow God enough space, allow the spirit room to enter in and renew us and refresh us. Thank you so much for this amazing conversation. We don't want to lose God in the use of this technology, which allows us to connect to so much. But is our technology allowing us to connect to God as well, or is it separating us from God? Uh, Dr. Detweiler, what do you think of virtual reality churches? They're starting to appear here and there. Do you think that VR churches could someday constitute a significant number of our Christian churches? Uh, what are their strengths and their weaknesses? What's your view? Well, the, yeah, the Sim Church is, is kind of a fascinating uh, idea. It was, it's somewhat inconceivable uh, in an earlier era, but it is clear that wherever two or three are gathered, right, the, God promises to be in, in our midst. And so we can, if we gather in an online space, surely the Spirit is present. God is with us. Um, I believe that, in a sense, the whole realm of glory, right, is, belongs to God. So I can't say that uh, VR space is separate from God's world or God's realm. Um, you have so many references to things like the cloud that have this kind of mysterious, uh, almost uh, transcendent notion that's embedded into a lot of what we do. I think the, the thing that I don't want us to lose in a, a VR type of church is that we are an embodied people and that Jesus is an incarnate, enfleshed God. And so we have physical needs, we have physical uh, limitations, 
uh, if I'm sick, I might need somebody to actually come to my house and bring me a, uh, you know, a cup of soup. I might need to physically ingest that um, elixir, that, that healing. Um, I, I might need to be hugged. I might need someone to sit with me and be present. It's somebody that's not a robot. It's not a, a, a you know, a virtual friend. Um, it's maybe not enough on Facebook to say, um, you know, I'll pray for you or uh, to send a heart emoji. It maybe takes us to actually get in the car and show what that heart emoji means which is to come be physically present with someone who's hurting, who's uh, in need of, to know that they're not alone. Um, and so I think as embodied people, we have to remember um, that that kind of uh, physical flesh, face to faceness can't be lost in a, a world of, of virtual experiences. Dr. Detweiler, you wrote this text, I Gods, How Technology Shapes Our Spiritual and Social Lives in 2013 now as we close out the decade and look to 2020 uh, if you were to write a new book on the relationship of faith and tech what might the talking points be well i actually uh interestingly at the, the time i wrote the book instagram and snapchat were in a sense much smaller concerns and i've seen that with my own uh teenagers that that uh, way of visually interacting with people has really overtaken their forms of communication. And so I have um, basically written a bit of a sequel called Selfies, Searching for the Image of God in a Digital Age. And uh, it, it takes that notion of the self as presented through these formats in visual ways and tries to say, well, where's God in the midst of that? And what is it that we're looking for when we present ourselves online? And have we outsourced our, our sense of worth? Um, and, and do we need to kind of turn back to God as that uh, creator? And in fact, turn even appreciate God as that original image maker. It's not just that we are made in God's image, but God is an image maker as well. And so it's an effort to kind of reclaim and call, redeem the selfie and uh, call us through Instagram and Snapchat to, to be much more intentional about taking ourselves seriously as artists, as people expressing ourselves, and as people who are made in the image of God, to challenge those who might dismiss those formats, to say, well, we've always been self-imaging people, and, uh, and that, that God can be glorified through that process as well. Your lecture at the January series at Calvin College earlier this year in January of 2019 was amazing, and I'm planning oh, to assign that to my global theology students. You know, in that class, we also deal a bit with faith and tech. I just so appreciated that lecture. Oh, beautiful. Book, Selfie. Thank you. Dr. Detweiler, if I can close with a question that I've been asking all of the interviewees on this program, and that is this, what would it mean for the church to be united today in this global tech uh, um, galvanized age how would we recognize the unity of the church? And what is it that we can do as Christians to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? Mm. Well, it's fascinating. I think in the first flush of technology, there was this notion of like, wow, we're going to be more together than ever before. And the, and the gaps between uh, nations and borders uh, in some ways collapsed. And we were able to reach across huge distances um, that our bodies couldn't normally touch. And yet that uh, enthusiasm, uh, that hopefulness, I think has been dashed by the clashes that we've seen that have emerged online. And so things that were maybe intended to unite us have ended up being even more divisive for us as a community of faith. I guess I would go back perhaps to um, H. Richard Niebuhr's classic book, Christ and Culture, where he outlined five different approaches to culture. And there's, a, there's historic basis for this. There's a biblical basis for these different approaches. Um, and yet we seem to kind of have forgotten that in, in the midst of the culture war. We, we, we've simply said my way or the highway, that I'm right and you're wrong. And uh, resorted to name calling and, and just uh, a lot of judgmentalism. And, and I guess I'd want to go back and say, well, you know, I may not be Amish, <laughs> but surely I can appreciate the Amish and their effort to want to opt out of this digital world. Uh, and for those who choose to go into a digital deep dive, I want uh, to know that, that, that God can find them in that place as well uh, through 
uh, the cell phone, through the technology, through entertainment. These are not necessarily times away from God. Hopefully they can be times with God. But we have to get past the judgment and condemnation of each other as to whether you're maybe a digital native, uh, a digital nomad, or a digital never. Um, these are not uh, salvific categories. <laughs> and so there's no need to kick people in or out of God's kingdom depending on how they choose to relate to the 21st century and these uh, totalizing uh, technologies that demand a lot of discernment on our part. It's our huge privilege today to be speaking with Dr. Craig Detweiler, author of I Gods, How Technology Shapes Our Spiritual and Social Lives, past president of the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology, currently uh, president of Wedgwood Circle. We're so grateful to be speaking with you today. Jonathan, keep up the great work, and thank you for paying attention to this really, really important issue.